to the meat. For those people who like to see things that are real, right? Or, or, or something like that. It's, it's very easy to talk about AI, and it's very fun as well. But this stuff becomes more meaningful when we take a look at some actual examples, understand how they're built, the types of AI systems that are being leveraged, and then actually show them in action. And this will illustrate you know, the general process of adapting AI to business use cases. This will showcase a couple of actual use cases in the open group with AI applied to them, and then we'll have a bit of a discussion around, you know, where the system is today, maybe what we could do if we wanted to move it to production. Right. Other ideas. So, uh, our first example is an assistant, or um, the colloquial term is chatbot. Really hate that because it makes it sound easy and ch churlish, but in fact, it's not. What a chatbot or an assistant is is essentially uh, a conversation between you and an AI. And like a conversation between two humans, when I asked Michael, you know something about cybersecurity? He says, no. And that <laughs> means I need to find somebody else. Um, but when I do find somebody who knows something about cybersecurity, we're likely to have a conversation where I ask them a series of questions and you know, they use their knowledge base around cybersecurity to provide me with answers. At the same time, a more motivated employee might say, I don't know anything about cybersecurity, but I can go find out for you because That's I know someone who does. Right. So if, if, if you have your cell phone and I don't and I ask you some question, you could actually type it in and, and go find it and then still give me the answer, which is a relevant analogy to, way, to the way that uh, an assistant or a chatbot works. So in that context, what does that mean? That means that I have to be talking to somebody who has a knowledge base, who has a corpus of information um, that has been trained around the subject matter that I'm interested in. And that means that you have to teach your assistant or chatbot um, the subject matter in which you want to use it. And uh, the use case that's most likely um, one that's familiar is a support use case. So there's an awful lot of situations where uh, companies or organizations staff will constantly field the exact same set of questions over and over and over again, and they really don't enjoy that very much. I don't know why. Um, <clears throat> so what you want to do is be able to provide a, uh, an experience where you feel like you're having a conversation. You want to create modality that uh, kind of syncopates with the human themselves. So it could be <coughs> voice recognition that is being used. Or it could, could just be um, natural language processing using text, which will be the example that we use today. But in reality, Michael has this set up so that you could actually, um, with TJBot, ask TJBot a question just you know, uh, via the voice. And the microphone in TJBot will pick that up, and then we'll pass it on to the chatbot that he has integrated into it. So. Uh, in the case of the example we're going to use today, we're going to use the Open Group Professions uh, standard and the support for becoming certified as the case study. And what we want to do is create a chatbot or an assistant that answers questions uh, about uh, becoming certified or moving from one certification level to the next or resetting your password or something of this nature. And so what does that mean for our, the process that we're going to go through to build that? Well, first off, um, we have to know something about what are the common questions that are asked, right? And so we went to Deborah and, in the, on the staff, and she came up with a document. Um, Michael and I, fortunately, had already been building a chatbot for something very similar called Carrie. What does Carrie stand for? Career Architect Certification Journey. It's not the best acronym, but I like it. <laughs> um, we didn't come up with, I don't think I came up with a very good uh, name of this particular chapter. Oh, you didn't. Uh, <laughs> I tried, but I, you know, it's like, uh, I think I. It's the hardest part of these systems, yeah, really. Right, yeah, naming them. <laughs> I, I think I came up with something like uh, Toby or something like that. Anyway, 
Um, so, so first off, you have to have some knowledge about uh, the subject. You want to know what are the questions that are going to be asked. Um, you certainly want to know what is the correct answer. You want to know the entities that are involved, right? So you want to know the, you know, the uh, the in, the data entities that are part of the subject matter in corpus. And you want to know the synonyms that are, might be used. So that is the alternative ways for asking the same question and getting the same expected answer. So I might say, I'd like to know something about certification or architect certification. But somebody else might ask, um, can you tell me about, or I would like to know about architect certification. Or I have a question about architect certification. Or even better, something as simple as certify me. Yeah, certify me. Not even a please on that one. Right. So let's get into this a little bit. You've got, you've got the Word document if you want to show some of the yeah, examples. Yeah, no, I was, I'm doing exactly that. Excellent. And I don't know if I can. All right. Ah, uh, you got it. Yeah. <laughs> it's backwards. All right, so here are some of the top questions that Deborah came up with. I'm, I'm an interested in applying for OpenCA certification and would like further information. And she even has a, uh, a reference uh, answer for us and a set of links. So one of the things that I can do is that I can actually integrate this with an existing system. And I can pass in from the environment information about who is using the system. Now, I didn't do this in this minimal viable product. But it can start off with saying, hi, Andrash, welcome to uh, Bob, or whatever our, the name of our, our certification uh, uh, chatbot might be. Um, I, can I help you with information about the open profession? Um, and I can also, if you know anything about Bank of America, and you, you might be from the United States, they launched a, uh, an assistant called Care, uh, Erica. And Erica is an IBM uh, solution. And Erica actually, you know, you just press the button and you say, can you show me my balance, Erica? And Erica will come back with the information about your balance. And you say, I'd like to know the last three transactions about my MasterCard. And it'll come back with that. And you can ask it all sorts of other reference questions. And it'll come back with um, guidance on how to find that information. So here it is. The uh, you know, first question was, I'm interested in OpenCA. Uh, the other one is, I'm an OpenCA certified, but I can't find my name in the directory. Uh, how do I set a personal code? Um, I'm certified, but I haven't received my badge. That's a nice one. I'm uh, certified through my employer, but they left the company. How do I keep my certification? I want to recertify, so on and so forth. So actually. Um, because of the work that we did with uh, Carrie, um, I had a little head start from the work that she provided to me. And there was actually much more that you really needed to know if you were going to make this a real conversational chatbot. So um, I've, uh, I've augmented um, what she gave me um, with uh, the information that we already knew. So this is the Awas uh, Watson Assistant uh, Canvas. I'm going to go ahead and open my profession assistant uh, space, workspace. And immediately, you have, you recognize that we have uh, a few um, elements here. One of them is intents. The other is uh, entities. Then you have dialogue and content dialogue. Uh, we won't be going into content dialogue, but let's say that, um, you know, again, you want to get a jump start, and you're in a particular space. Uh, what we've come up with is uh, uh, a you know, taxonomy for you to use kind of out of the jar. So let's look at our intents. We're in the intent space. Um, so what are some of the intents that somebody might have when interacting with an assistant around certification? Well, and let, me, and let, me, let me paint it a different way for those who are uh, tuned to some of the other machine learning AI language. Think of these. Uh, think of this as a supervised learning system, and think of these as your sentence-level classifications. How many of these do we want? Well, the question, as Andros has posed.
users really comes down to what do we want to recognize when a user is interacting with us talking about uh, the, the open professions? Well, one question might be is who, who is the heck is the open group itself? And um, so I've created an intent called the open group. I can add a description here to which I didn't do at, at that time. Like, you know, I would like to know if I can see.
know, was either about getting certified as a, a business architect or as an IT architect, as an example. And I can create state and, I, and flow within the dialogue. So I can mirror what your expected uh, experience should be. So for example, um, in this particular uh, dialogue, you come in, you get a welcome statement, you're expected to probably ask about what type of architect or, or specialty that you're going to get certified in, and then you drop down into the intents that are specific to those particular types. And they, in turn, provide you with information about where to find more context around those areas. So, um, here I've got, for example, if we look at this, uh, generalized questions. Generalized questions uh, are pertinent to both, and soon all three certification, open profession certification programs. So there are general questions about certification within the open group under the open profession certification themselves. So uh, questions about accredited uh, program certification, converged certification, certification pay, where I can find you know, help with respect to a claim, I need to get an extension on my certification, um, where do I find the open CA FAQ? Um, and then I, I would also add one here for open SIT. Um, I need a mentor, I need support. In other words, I gotta talk to somebody. Um, how do I get a, you know, a, a, a question to a, 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 a human being, uh, so on and so forth. You wanna make sure that that last piece about getting to support is kind of the last op option um, when using a chatbot because you're really trying to solve their problem before it gets to be uh, a human. Right, um, and, and many of these capabilities, like at least the capability IBM has, has analytics on the back end, which is pretty important because you know the questions that you expect that are reported, but when, when you end up with an AI system that is as easy as going to a URL, you don't know what people are asking. And the example Andros provided about the linkage between certification and pay was a question that people didn't realize we were getting asked as often as we were getting asked. So early on, we have a set of ideas that represent what we think people are going to ask and answers that we think address that. But this system is a stake in the ground. And it's almost like a, a customer sentiment station that can hear questions and later on give you answers and insight around what do people really ask about. Yeah. Maybe when you tell people that there's not a direct linkage between certification and pay, they get really upset. You know, and that might inform the way you create your messaging and perhaps the way you address some of your policies. So uh, in the case of asking you know, about the open group, like who the heck is the open group? Or just open group, if I were just We've to say. We've got minutes left on this section, so okay. we can buzz faster and sh shorten All the last right. piece. Um, what, what this does is says, hey, I recognize that this is a question about uh, the open group or the entity, the open group. And here is the text that I'm providing back, and a URL, and the image of the open group. And, and in here, I've got uh, different additional answers that I can provide. Ask me about the open group, open CA, open SIT. Ask me about uh, open profession certifications. And, and you can do that random or sequentially. So this is the back end that gets trained um, on this. Let's, let's pretend like I need to add, uh, and here, I want to recertify, what do I need to do? So the question is really, I want to recertify. So I'm just going to copy that. And you can think of that as your data curation step. You'll see all the answers, all the questions you get asked, but ultimately, you want to try to refine that into a signal that is obvious to the system, or more obvious, we'd say. And I'm going to add an intent. And I'm going to call this ask I can't see. That does help. Space between the underscore and the R. Yeah, 
creating these kinds of examples to represent a class, then we need to provide a lot of diversity. If we just kept on with recertification and recertify, the system would likely be trained that anything with the word recertify or recertification is immediately about this. That's not wrong, but then we'd miss the opportunity to recognize question, um, statements like, how do I renew my certification? My certification is about to expire. I have expired certification. So it's important as you're generating, even for this um, rather simple example of a chat system, you really have to make sure your data set is diverse enough to represent reality. You don't want to bias it in, in one way or another so it fails to recognize all the possible um, inputs a user may provide. So um, in, in this process, uh, I am setting context <coughs> so that the profession is equal to architect. So I know I'm, I, that the person is already either selected uh, architect or, or specialist as their, as their profession. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and go down here and, and add it to my, add uh, to the dialogue here, a node. And I'm going to call this node. training it 
when you're developing it but training it as people are using it and we'll show you how that works in a second so there you go now I'm getting more information about open CA right out of the box there and let's see uh, I want to get research divide and let's see here So this highlights some of the complexity that exists because in this system you have on one hand a set of classifications at the sentence level, another a set of classifications at the phrase level. These are all distinct data sets that you train in real time as you develop the system. Powered by both of those sets, phrase level and sentence level classes, you have this ultimate, the brain and the logic of chatbot. And you know these systems as you're seeing all have separate components that might evolve separately. The classification and the data behind those classes may change over time. The logic that he's showcasing here may change over time based on the business process. So even for this simple example of a, an assistant, as we said chatbot was churlish, there's still some complexity. I mean, you have expertise here, it's people who know the questions that are being asked, but it takes some effort to characterize, you know, what are people gonna ask? How do we wanna answer them? And then how do we connect those two to some experience that is meaningful? So we collect data that's relevant, and we give them answers to the questions that we think will resolve their, uh, resolve their concern. Yeah. So this is uh, one of the modalities. This is just an embedded web page.
self-assessment, use the self-assessment tool, and, um, and where to get information about the fee. So that goes to show you that you can embed this in different types of clients. Um, I'm going to have to actually figure out why that I retrained the model to, uh, to break, but hey, that was a good exercise that at least showed you that you had to be careful about uh, how you actually program these things. But um, so but prior to breaking the model, I was actually uh, getting all of the right answers about where to find information about OpenCA, OpenSIS. Uh, I could go down to the stream. Uh, I could ask how to get certified uh, you know, as an enterprise architect, which seems to be working right now. Well, and what's noteworthy and meaningful about showing something like an integration with a chat application like Slack is Slack has a web experience, a desktop experience, but also a phone experience. So by having this AI system that we've now okay. trained on this open CA, these open professions, and we can now see it experienced on a different modality. And most AI systems are likely going to have different manifestations across, you know, web, thin client, thick clients, and even here mobile. And courtesy of a mobile device, I have, you know, my mobile device providers in, uh, in automatic speech to text if I wanted to yell at this thing and get an answer back. So these are some of the ways that you take these basic AI capabilities and plug them into what is the existing ecosystem and end up with very rich user experiences where you're not responsible for the entire implementation. some 
customer, um, some customer experience, so you know, before they even say hello, exactly who you're talking to. And that can inform some of our dialogue as far as the answer we provide. For instance, the answer you give someone like him may be different when you ask about certification versus someone like me who's not yet but soon to be certified. So now looking at another system, which is similar but with a different context. Um, we're going to look at another question and answer system, but in the context of TOGAF 9.2. Now TOGAF 9.2, for folks who are aware of the open group, you know, is a great open group standard. It describes different ways that we can create and do enterprise architecture. There's a lot of great expertise, and many folks may even get a certification in TOGAF to show that expertise. One common um, occurrence, though, is that folks who are new to TOGAF, even if they're certified, may have some difficulty in understanding how do I do a thing with TOGAF. I mean, they may be certified, they may have good expertise and good mentors, but they may just not understand how to translate a real world issue into something like TOGAF. Or they might know something about TOGAF and they want to learn more about that something. So the approach we've taken here is to take a similar thing like we showed with a chatbot, but now oriented to TOGAF. Now in the case of TOGAF, we have a document that's very knowledge heavy. So what we did is run it through a data pipeline, similar to what we showed earlier, and create an application which, latency permitting, we can use to run queries against. This application serves to provide some kind of insight into TOGAF. Now keep in mind, our core user here includes people who are experts at TOGAF and may likely know answers to people who have never heard of TOGAF before. And they don't really know where to start, but they have some ideas, they have some words that they know that carry some meaning. So the way one would interact with this system is you take whatever question you have about TOGAF. And you know TOGAF pretty well, Andros. What's a good question? Um, let's see. What are the stages in the ADM, architecture development method? Let's be easy. Let's make it a long version. Architecture development method. And let's see how latency treats us today. <coughs> So what's happening as we're sending this question, right? This is, question is being sent in this implementation as an unstructured query. So this sentence is being diced up. It's being tokenized. They're using traditional search technologies, but they're also using a bit of AI-empowered search. Each of these documents relating to TOGAF have been you know, processed by AI, digested into pieces of meaning. Segmentation is what we call that. And it's been presented at, within an AI-empowered search index. So when you do a search and you ask this question, it goes beyond just the simple text search. Behind the scenes, we could implement more customized training that maybe when we see architectural development method, we also look for instances of ADM. We may also do the reverse kind of inference that if you see ADM, we might extend that to be architecture development method. Whatever the case, we do a search and we get back a set, of, a set of candidate responses. Now these responses are, again, chunks pulled from the TOGAF standard itself. Um, in this particular system we've developed, they're just provided to us with some metadata and a link to see the extension of that section. We don't make any additional inference or assumption from there because this system is really meant to be a basic example implementation. So we see our, our, our top item here with a score of 0 0.5. That's this system's sense that I think this is relevant to you. This system under the covers has not been finely tuned to know exactly what we think is relevant. We've just loaded documents and worked with it in that state to showcase just where AI algorithms can be without much training. And so the first section we have is called building blocks. And this is a section likely, if I, if I jump out here real quick, from the TOGAF standard itself. And if we open it up, we can see the actual text from this section and the, the parts of our search query that were found. Now in this case, we're doing a, a fairly, rudimentary, uh, fairly rudimentary search. So the responses we're getting back include the tokenization of each individual word highlighted here. There's also a possibility for us to take this kind of query and again, break it up into um, a search just looking for passages, where we ask the AI system under the covers to go a step further and not return us the whole answer, or the whole section, but instead to return us what it thinks are the most relevant sections within that document. And so here within this section, we see some description about the TOGAF ADM. We see some description of the different building blocks within TOGAF ADM, as well as 
those general characteristics of those building blocks. We can, uh, be because we had to break it up, we, uh, there are 109 documents that, uh, or segments of TOGAF that uh, match um, with uh, 93 positive sentiment, 6 neutral, and 10 negative. I would assume 10, 10 negative are like anti-patterns or something like that, you know, because this is a methodology. But uh, for, for whatever reason, somebody wrote those 10 uh, sections in a negative tone. Uh, that's, that's exactly correct. And what's important to distinguish here is this system in the current basic implementation, again, is not doing a very complex processing of the question. So we've, not, we've intentionally done that to showcase what systems can do sort of wi without much tweaking. What, what, what one can do as one evolves a system like this is progress it by adding more advanced analysis of the search phrase. And I'd like to showcase that architecture here. So this represents a possible extension of what we've just shown, where instead of passing the question directly to your search index that has AI behind it, you do several levels of pre-processing of your question. This pre-processing can be similar, can be thought of in a similar fashion as to what you saw with the um, professions chatbot. We're going to try to classify the question to figure out what manner of question is it, and we're going to try to do phrase level um, classification to say, you know, he's asking about a relationship and he mentions TOGAF and he mentions ADM. There's an implied relationship between those two concepts that we think is meaningful. So to showcase that at a, at a very high level, we, I've actually got another very simple system here. And this very basic system just accepts a phrase and attempts to digest it using a very shallow set of training data that we've provided. So in this case, um, the training data here is around um, asking some of the similar TOGAF questions. So um, this system is trained on our custom you know, sentence level classifiers um, and, but it also has um, phrase level classification that's untrained. So this is stuff pulled from things like Wikipedia. So if we send this question out, what we get back is a classification of our question. Again, this is based on the training data in that spreadsheet. It's very shallow. Um, we trained it that based on questions like this, we think you're asking about inputs. We think you're asking about you know, at what point in this ADM process do your business continuum requirements serve as an input? At the same time, in our untrained model that does, you know, Wikipedia-style analysis of phrases, it picked up ADM as an organization. Now, we know that's not right. We know that has different meaning. But this general purpose model that we're showcasing perceives ADM as the acronym representing a company. Because in most other contexts, you know, a, an acronym like IBM, like TOG for the open group does represent an enterprise or an organization. But so if we were to take our search system on top of TOGAF and evolve it further, we would do an approach like this to try to understand at a deeper level the semantic meaning of what, it, what is a person asking about, combined with about what are they asking, and use that to do a much more targeted query. So another system that we'd like to at least bring to mention as another possible example of of something with AI aligned towards you know, some of the business of standards, though unfortunately we don't have an easy way to demo it, is a conference call transcription system. Within the work of standards development, there's a lot of great dialogue. You've heard some of it here in the conference today, people presenting, people sharing ideas. Right now there are folks um, in member meetings having discussions about problems and having um, spirited uh, dialogue about it's this way, no it's that way, no it's a service, no it's not a service, etc. An important part of generating standards from that kind of activity is taking notes, taking minutes, on recording what people are saying and distilling that into a sense of significance where you say, so and so from IBM said this and there's the implication of it. So and so from another company said that. Here's the implication or the action inferred from that. So in a current process, these minutes are generated using an artisanal process. They're handmade. And there's value in that because there's a lot of context required for many of these minutes to be meaningful. You have to know what the group is doing to understand what's the significance of what someone just said. So another way this could be empowered by AI would be the use of AI for audio transcription. So in the case of a system that you know it exists on my laptop but not something fun to demo, um, you can play audio to the system 
and the system can transcribe the text of what people are saying and then send it back as text associated with that meeting. This represents a fairly low-hanging fruit when it comes to AI application. Where things get interesting and uh, potentially a little scary is what you do with that data. Because in that data set, you now have a lot of insight coming back around who said what, what is this forum talking about? In this forum's meeting yesterday, did they talk about that forum? And those kinds of insights are valuable and useful. Though for our initial example here, we looked at it more from a cost-saving perspective of figuring out how to help automate the process of minutes. So really, for many of these systems, it comes down to understanding the question that you're being asked. Um, as we saw, this is not a trivial thing, but it can be addressed if you're very intentional and narrow about how you want to scope your, your efforts. In the case of the chatbots, you have the brilliance of your chatbot engineers, of your business process owners, folks who know the domain well, like Andros and some of the staff at the Open Group. In the case of something more open-ended like TOGAF, you have a sea of insurmountable questions, the ones you know people are going to ask and the ones you don't know. And you can attempt to use AI to create intelligence around that. And you can also attempt to use a little bit of staff expertise to train the system to be able to you know, decompose those questions into some kind of meaningful query. But ultimately, you go from that question, from that unstructured data, into some kind of structure that enables deeper insights that enables things like entity resolution, that enables us to understand that when someone asks a question to our TOGAF system, they're specifically talking about a particular concept within TOGAF that we can have the system meaningfully assert is part of this section. So at this point, we've, we've sort of concluded the live demo section, session, and we've done it probably uh, 21 minutes over, so we've got about nine minutes. I mean, one of the things that I... Uh uh, didn't show you was that um, we can actually get information about how the chatbot is being used. And here we have analytics that show the conversation um, and the amount of conversation usage and the top intents and the top in entities that were utilized. And this gives us kind of an idea of, of whether or not we're getting the right information about um, that particular intent. Like, you know, that we can select the open group and, and see, you know, what the, uh, what the context was there. You can see that there were a total of uh, 12 conversations about the open group. conversation over the last few days, you know, dipped and then increased uh, in context. So we can also take the log and look at uh, the types of questions that are being asked and determine whether we're getting any errors or not. And then we can retrain the chatbot based on what, you know, that, that particular data shows. And you'll see some of this process might remind you of some of the work you do in software development. You deploy a system, you have it in a point where you think it works, and then you just have to continually analyze it, see how it's working, modify it, update it as you need to. And this is where we see you know, a lot of importance on treating that as a separate formal process, hence some of the guidance we've given so far and some of what we see with many clients today. Yep. So... One of the things that you would do uh, is probably pretty this up, put it on a, another interface, maybe even change the modality so that you could use just natural language recognition. And one of the other things that we can do without any kind of effort whatsoever is run it through a translator and go back and forth between English and another language. And, uh, and talk to somebody who is a non-native English speaker so they can say, I'd like to talk to you in Japanese or something of that nature uh, without any effort whatsoever. And I don't have to spend any money on translation. Now that approach is one approach to localization. IBM has done both. In some of our larger enterprise systems, we try to uh, compare answers in the translated language to answers in the native language itself. But based on the complexity of your system, the, the, the sort of 
translation upon question received will likely work for many use cases. And there are some parts of at least IBM where we do use that to take advantage of providing you know, multilingual experiences without having to invest in deep uh, translator um, expertise for you know, a variety of translation tasks. Or you could just do the translation and see if it's right and tweak it, right? Yeah. So you don't have to spend a lot of time with it. That's the other thing. So, and you could uh, use the information that comes out of this as analytics to tell you about what uh, the sentiment of uh, you know, working with the open profession uh, chatbot is. You know? Certainly. And, and though you know, for many of these AI projects, you initially build them with the intent of addressing a business problem, like automating the creation of minutes or saving the staff from having to respond to a bunch of important questions that all have the same answers. But as Andros mentioned, over time, you'll create data that allows your enterprise to, to do the next step. Then maybe you look at all the questions you're getting and determine that, hey, a lot of people need guidance on one particular part of OpenCA. Perhaps we should change or add additional guidance to that section, right? Perhaps we should evolve our offering and the documentation for that offering. Similarly to the TOGAF example, if we find a lot of people are asking questions about something we don't really address in TOGAF, maybe that now informs us that that's a new area of extension. And this is, you know, an example of how organizations truly become data-driven, is that you have systems that feed on your data, thrive on your data, and generate more data in turn that you can use to evaluate, you know, the next best step for better business outcomes. All right, where do we go from here? Well, we've got some lessons learned to share in the last four to five minutes. Right. And I'm sure we can jump through those rel relatively quickly. Oh, bias. My favorite. And brand identity. Um, so, bias. Uh, my favorite example of bias recently was a situation where a company was actually uh, using AI to find the best candidate which, by the way, we do actually do in IBM. We score your skills, and we actually are trying to rate employees based on AI assessments. And those assessments actually use things like information about the skills that you attain through a claim, uh, the classes you've taken in within the formal training you've taken, uh, information about your social eminence, uh, how many assets you've contributed, stuff like that. Don't forget your certification. And your certification, <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, recently a company actually uh, was using a model like this and uh, they found that it was uh, selecting against certain universities and uh, potentially against women. Yep. And, um, and, you know, when Michael and I really dug into their model, uh, the AI was doing what it intended to do, find the best candidates. Um, but it was using some data that it, it got from a few sources that was leading it down the wrong path to, right. from training. But in reality, did they really need to have gender in there at all? Right, and that's, you know, that's the question. I mean, this example, right, this organization looking for the next big tech talent, and it just so happened in their existing data set of the people they had hired, many of them were men. And the AI system, which, you know, they didn't have hands on everything, kind of reasoned, well, what do these top performers have in common? Well, men. one of the things happens Gen to be that they're men. So what ended up happening when people were submitting is it would look and recognize mention of gender and score that as a not negative thing in the case of women, but rather just a positive thing in the case of men, because the system just blindly reasoned. There are ways to handle this, and um, I kind of had a laugh when I learned about it, because they're relatively well known. There are ways to hide the features that you don't want the system to learn from. So the system doesn't see male or female, it just sees strong technology background, maybe leadership, maybe you know, they, maybe they're, they're in the arts as well, right? Gotta have your balance. But when you give it data that's not curated or shaped properly, the system will pick up on weird things. I mean, I was a little sad to find out that the system didn't reason that people with dogs end up being better employees. Yeah. In, in my sample size of one, that's the trend I see. But in reality, too, you might want some bias in the system. Like Certainly. You might want to have more minorities because you don't have enough minorities. And even though they aren't really, you know, kind of bubbling up to the top of the performers list, you want to promote them or score them higher to assess them sooner in the cycle. Um, so in some cases, um, you, you actually culturally want bias 
um, put into the system. So you know, it's a little tricky dribble, right? Yeah. I mean, in the case of the tech company, again, they might notice that their best performers have formal tech backgrounds. That just might be unarguable. And I know some people say hire the bachelors in history, and not to say they're bad programmers, but let's say their data today says all of their strong folks have computer science undergrads and maybe masters as well. But you want more diversity because you say we need people who don't come from strict tech backgrounds but learn tech later. You might have the system say if you're a non-tech background, like Andros was mentioning, let's give you some extra points. Let's not exclude you immediately or let's score you in a separate pool with separate parameters, that being one of them. Yeah, that's one way of doing it. So you look for top performers but maybe they don't necessarily have a uh, you know, tech background or the same tech background, but they're trainable. <laughs> just like the system. Yeah. Okay. So we're so f we're formally on the hour, but I think we can jet yeah. through what we've got. So so um, you know this is uh, bias comes in different forms, um, and um, you know some of the challenges that you face with deployment of these things into the uh, enterprise, you know that that kind of boils down to trust and transparency, is around the difficulty in you know integrating it into the business applications themselves, uh, managing the uh, you know internal policies, the resistance to AI, um, and uh, lack of uh, of DevOps or those the, those skills that we talked about earlier that aren't necessarily readily available. You're going to have to train them, um, and um, maybe not even understanding the analytics of the data itself. Certainly. So, you know, there's uh, three different or four different um, particular roles here that we really have to, you know, focus on. We talked a little bit about this before, but there's, you know, building, uh, you know, the the solution. So the data scientist's role, the running of the solution, the creating the solution, which is part of the software engineer's uh, responsibility, and this whole idea of of AI management. Uh, and um, business user uh, coming together. And, and those folks have a lot of responsibility and trust and integrity to make sure the model is working the right way. Um, so we did come up with a project that uh, we call OpenScale that we're inviting other companies that were open sourcing. And it's, uh, it's really kind of scrubbing, uh, intended to scrub your model to make sure that you're not putting an unintended bias into it, things like adding gender or, or ethnicity or biasing against a certain school, let's say that uh, you know, you're, it, all of a sudden your AI model starts picking West Coast schools versus East Coast schools. If it doesn't know anything about them, then possibly um, it can't bias uh, selection from, you know, uh, bias uh, folks who go to the University of Virginia versus UCAL, UCAL Berkeley or something like that, right? Um, so OpenScale is intended to, you know, actually look at, at payload logging uh, from an integrity point of view, um, making sure that there is a, a, a visibility into how the model is performing operationally, um, be able to uh, more fully explain the model um, define some tests to determine fairness, so it generates data for you to actually run through the model, um, and then creates that model ops piece that we've been talking about. Um, and this is uh, really important because um, bias has actually become an inhibitor to use AI because people had you know looked at the unintentional um, you know use of, uh, of of gender that was included in the model previously. So um, how does AI impact your brand, Michael? Well, you know, as we saw with a couple of interactions we had with the sample systems we showcased, you have, whenever you interact with an IT system representing an organization or providing expertise attributed to an organization, it, in essence, becomes a representative of that organization. This is why when I work with any customers to build any AI systems that are externally facing, I always have uh, someone from marketing in the room and I always have someone who represents the core <coughs> business transaction or interaction. Because these AI systems ultimately define someone's experience. Like if someone interacted with our chatbot and managed to confuse it, they'd say, man, this group is crud, you know, this 
certification is no good. And we all know that's not true, but the experience they had would give them that sense. They would walk away with that same idea if they interacted with someone with the open group who was just as rude, because it's a frustrating experience. Now, if I, if I get questions, I'll send them to Michelle, because I know she's nice, so they'll like the open group. But this is a key thing you have to understand. All of these brand touch points becoming automated still has huge implications. This is why we're big on human in the loop for most things, because this human experience that AI creates, again, is going to define that market, that brand identity you have in the market. Yeah. So there's a few approaches here. There's five, to be honest with you, and obviously. And uh, we showed two of them. Um, you know, the customer service interaction uh, with uh, Chatbot and uh, enhancing the work of the knowledge worker, getting insight into the structure of uh, Togaf through uh, the use of uh, IBM uh, Watson Discovery. Uh, so, uh, but there is also managing complexity and risk. So we integrate uh, AI into things like Watson Cybersecurity. Um, so taking massive amounts of data that's coming out of the enterprise on how your security is functioning is, is certainly a good model. Um, using it to find the best uh, talent. So we do actually use that in our uh, talent systems uh, within IBM. And to empower developers uh, to actually create AI-based uh, applications themselves, right? Yep. I mean, in our case, we showed a few example applications, but in reality, you know, you would build up the underlying AI systems, and then that's a thing you can integrate with for other experiences. You could take that chat bot and have it a phone line that one calls in, for example, instead of just a web-based experience. So, I mean, here's you know just some other examples of some of the ways one can get started and, and work. But again, it, it really follows pretty much everything we've been describing, the way you can sort of improve some of these business processes, target what's critical to your enterprise, and figure out, do I have data around this? And can I apply just enough AI to get started, preferably AI someone else built, where then I can just focus on deriving value from that interaction? You know, the subject you really like. <sighs> well, when it comes down to these systems, at the end of the day, the architecture still matters. I mean, in our example of showcasing some of these few sample applications, right? we edited the model on the fly, and things got crazy and hairy very quickly. That's all realities, right? These systems have an inherent complexity. And maintaining them and making them successful still requires architecture. The architecture from the application perspective, architecture from the data perspective, from the model perspective. In the enterprise systems that, that we've built doing even chat stuff, you've got multiple environments, you've got some kind of, you actually have a change review board, a change management board. I know we think it's an ugly word, but you know those processes still serve value. And, and architecture is a core part of that. Yeah, that's certainly true. And um, we've tended to throw architecture out with the, you know, the baby with the bathwater kind of analogy. Uh, we went uh, we went to agile. We went iterative. We created this idea of uh, minimal viable pro uh, product, but the product is not really viable, and it's sometimes not even minimal. But all the data is generating <laughs> is building up technical debt if it's not the right solution. So you definitely have to think in terms of the illities because right now ag agile and design thinking is all about outside in and it thinks of it in terms of the, how the user wants to interact with the system. That's great but as we know you know, from the open group a lot of the success of your system is all of the illities, the 40 different illities, the non-functional requirements that are necessary to build a system that's maintainable. And uh, you have to begin to think about the architecture from the inside of the system out instead of the, uh, the end user perspective, which is mostly what we're doing these days. And I think that's it. Yeah. Wow. We made it to the end. <laughs> Any last minute questions before we let you escape? It is 509.
privileges, then I'm probably going to have to fall back to a uh, past corpus. Yeah, I mean, it comes down to data curation, right? This is why Microsoft Tay suffered such an untimely fate. Um, if, if you let just anyone, you know, adjust the model, you're, you're, you're going to have a bad time. And this is where I brought back the comment of DevOps. You want to be able to move these things quickly. In the case of our internal version of the nameless chatbot we showed, we've got our IBM's global career team who works with um, IBM's technical career path. And once a week, they look at the data. Once every two weeks, they propose changes to each other. And once every month or so, they actually make these changes. Sometimes they make them on the fly. But you know, we sort of empower them using DevOps methodology to make a mistake. And if something goes bad, they have a button I put that they push, and you run your DevOps pipeline, and you take the old stuff and you know throw it away and put back in the put back in the uh, put in the new stuff, or vice versa, right? I mean, it goes back to that same fail fast, fail forward methodology. In our case, you saw right the caveman version of it: people typing, "Oh, I think it should be this or whatever." And if you make a mistake, going back is really hard. But with DevOps practices that we all know and love, testing, rapid iterations, you can start to address a lot of that complexity.